Thanks for tuning in to another Dolphins podcast. Holy cow, it is already week 12, and today we are previewing Sunday's matchup at Hard Rock Stadium between the Miami Dolphins and New England Patriots. This is round two between these AFC East rivals, but Josh, I have a feeling, call me crazy, that this round might look a little bit different than the 15-10 to 10 slugfest we saw earlier this season featuring Jacoby Brissett and Snoop Huntley. Yeah, just a little bit different. Uh, but to a time of lower back, I don't, I don't think he's lost yet, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. He has yet to lose to the New England Patriots. I saw a reporter tell him that they were six and one. I think he might be counting a, a game before two has started, but he's still six and zero. Oh, and Drake Mays looked pretty good. So yeah, this is gonna be a much different game than Jacoby Brissett versus Snoop Huntley. And we can never overlook a division rival like the New England Patriots as much as we want to come on here and do so. The Dolphins. Last time they played the Patriots, it was like I just mentioned, the 15 to 10 win. And that was the only win that broke up two three game losing streaks for the Miami Dolphins. It was a game the Dolphins definitely had to win. I'm actually impressed they were able to pull it out with Snoop Huntley behind center. Uh, But Josh, both of these teams look so much more different, so much more than just the quarterback too. The Patriots have swapped wins and losses for the past month following a six game losing streak earlier in the year. Um, Does this feel trap gaming right at the top from you you have an afc east rival you have drake may who it's like a a container of fireworks that could go off at any second and that could be good or bad so so josh what are your thoughts yeah i mean this can i i definitely you can definitely say it's a trap game i guess i mean these division games we should never overlook but i mean with how the dolphins are playing i feel like this is the most confident you know the fans are the most confident this team has been playing. And I mean, um, to have the New England Patriots who, you know, they've been fighting, like you said, slugging out some matchups, I think 28, 22 loss last week to the mm-hmm. Rams. Um, so they're playing hard football, but um, it does feel like a game where the Dolphins should beat them up. And that's what scares me a little bit, especially with Drake may who, again, like you mentioned, man, is that, that firecracker, that, you know, game changer, so to speak, that we're uncertain about, right? We've seen uh, Jacoby Brissett time and time again. I mean, he was on our sideline at one point, but we don't know what Drake May is capable of beside what we see on film, which is a player that can extend plays and, you know, looks much better than a Mac Jones. So let's be honest, man, there was a time when people were gushing about Mac Jones. This is a much different team and a much different player than we've seen in the past from the Patriots. How do you... How do you compare this, Josh? Because I, I remember one thing about the Titans game, and, and we were both kind of right on this, was the idea of we wanted the unknowns of Will Levis. I think it was like the second play of the game. He threw an interception to Emmanuel Agba's like thighs, I think it was. And then Mason Rudolph comes in, and he just kind of stuck to the script where he had that Jacoby Brissett feel, right? Where it's we're going to get four yards here. We're going to get a sad three yards on third and 12 and just punt the ball away. There wasn't that unknown, that unknown explosiveness that Will Levis had. Why does it feel different about a few months later that we have Drake May where it's that unknown explosiveness and we're feeling like, oh, this could be a danger for the Dolphins, where when it was Will Levis, we were just kind of like laughing about it. I mean, my first my first thing would be he's not Will Levis, but I'm just <laughs> but, all jokes, know, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but all jokes aside, I mean, I mean, uh, why do is it feel different? I guess we can other than the not being Will Levis again, it's just it's the New England Patriots team that we've we've struggled with. It's Drake May, who I mean, I had written down, I believe. Um, he has scrambled to run on 11.2% of his dropbacks, the second highest rate. He's fourth in scramble yards and averages 10 yards per run. And he has a league high nine missed tackles as a quarterback. I think he has a run for 15 yards or longer in each, uh, has one run of 15 yards or longer in each of his starts. So he has some of that sneaky mobility that, again, the Miami Dolphins have struggled with. And he's not Will Levis. You know, he's a, he's a quarterback first. This is a guy who I think before he went back to school, many analysts had him as that QB1 coming out, you know, a few years ago. So um, there's a lot to like about Drake May and be, not being Will Levis would be at the top of that list. The best way we cannot let Drake May win this game, it's how the Dolphins won last week. The entire second half, man, it's every single drive you're scoring on. I don't have, I'm not saying it has to be that uh, dramatic, but you keep Jake Bailey on that sideline. You keep Tua Tungabailoa out on the field, Josh. And that's how I think the Miami Dolphins can win this game. You mentioned that the Patriots are coming off a 28 to 22 loss to the Rams. And I want to start there, Josh. Are the Dolphins kind of at a disadvantage playing the Shanahan tree back to back weeks? Uh, with the Patriots playing this Shanahan tree back-to-back weeks, I should say. Uh, Last week, I thought it was interesting because both Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua went over 100 receiving yards. And the Miami Dolphins have two very awesome wide receivers as well. One of 
Dolphins Twitter's favorite clips was that um, it was against the Patriots. It was right before halftime. It was a very close game. Jalen Waddle on a slant wide open. Tua throws it, and I think he's walking back to the sideline even before Waddle's into the end zone because he just knows it's that halftime dagger. Uh, but, Josh, what was so weird about that Patriots and Rams game, we're used to the Patriots having these awesome, awesome game plans. The Rams have Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. The only reason they both went over 100 yards is because you have an up-and-coming stud, a second-year cornerback in Christian Gonzalez, who was shadowed on one side of the field. He got the big banjo treatment where he was covering Demarcus Robinson for the entire game, letting Co- Cooper Cup, letting Puka Nakua just go out there and cook. After seeing this happen, Josh, just seven days ago, do you feel that the Patriots are going to mix things up? The idea of, like, we just faced this type of offense and they cooked us? Or are they going to be that stubborn New England team where it's like, all right, Christian Gonzalez, go go cover River Craycraft, no offense, just doing the out routes over and over? Yeah, it is definitely uh, baffling. I see some Patriot fans that I follow on Twitter or Blue Sky and things like that. They're they're a little upset with the game plan that Gerard Mayo has there. So, I mean, it kind of feels like with us and the whole, like you said, Jalen Ramsey situation, if they're smart, though, you got to put Christian Wilkins on uh, Tyreek Hill. I had. Oh my God! Is that what I say? Christian, you have to. Put, I'm missing that man. Apparently, you have to put Christian Gonzalez on Tyreek Hill in uh, Week Five. Gonzalez matched up with Hill in 72.4 percent of routes, allowing only two receptions on six targets for 34 yards. And Hill has only caught four of his 14 targets on deep passes this season. Christian Gonzalez, not Wilkins, has allowed only one deep reception. So if they're smart, they're going to line up Tyreek Hill versus Christian Gonzalez because in the past, I mean, there has been some success. There has been some success there, but I mean, what we're seeing is with the defense is playing those two high shells and kind of throwing these guys off at the line. It's it's honestly um, throwing the entire offense off, and that's why we're seeing some of these, you know, this dink and dunk type of stuff. So yes, go back to Christian Gonzalez and Tyreek Hill if you're the New England Patriots. But for us, man, in our fantasy teams, no man, we don't want Christian Gonzalez covering uh, Tyreek Hill. Please no. I know the idea you want to like the the Bills are the class of the division, but I think one of the things that the Dolphins have going for them, and, and it's why I love Tua, and it's why I love extending Jalen Waddle. These guys are at their best against division rivals. Last year, Tyreek Hill is out against the uh, New York Jets. Tua and, and Jalen Waddle put on an absolute show against a stout defense led by Sauce Gardner. So I really enjoyed that. I think. You know, you mentioned Tua being undefeated against the Patriots. Waddle always has some of his best games against the Patriots. And that's kind of what we've been able to enjoy the last few years as a Dolphins fan. And Josh, I want to ask you, are defenses going to start playing the Dolphins a little differently? Tua's been back for a month. They scored at least 27 points in three of those four games. It hasn't been Tyree Kill. It hasn't been Jalen Waddle. It's been that dinking and dunking. But we reached a very critical point where you had a play where Jonu Smith broke wide open. Free. Like the entire point of facing this Dolphins offense, Josh, this entire year was limiting big plays. We're going to limit the big plays. And the way you do that is Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle make sure they're covered by 17 people. Now that you have John U. Smith being that guy that's all alone, I remember talking about the, the last year, man, or two years ago when you're facing Buffalo uh, in week 17. No, that was last year. And you have a backup tight end, a third string tight end. His first catch of his career comes out, scores a touchdown. The Dolphins are starting to get that impact from other players. How much can opposing defenses see a Johnny Smith wide open, score two touchdowns in a game, go for over 100 yards before we say, oh, God, we got to make some more changes to the defense and the domino effect that comes with that? I mean, any week we should be just starting to see it, right? I mean, at this oh. point, you keep, we keep seeing these defenses playing those two. You got to bring one of those guys down, and then that's going to open up the big play. But, I mean – you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. I think the teams are probably okay with trying to, uh, you know, the death by a thousand paper cuts, as I call it. But how frustrated do you have to be if you're a defense, you know, settling into zones and you just see two a sling one like perfectly between three guys and it just lands, you know, eight yards into John Smith's hands and then picks up what, 16 or 17 yards yak. I mean, you're right, man. This offense is built to stretch defenses and, you know, kind of break them late at different parts of the, the season. So um, I'm intrigued to see how they can build on that. And I, I want to know when Alec Ingle comes back, how that affects this run game too, because yeah, we haven't really seen this run game as explosive as we saw in the beginning of the season. And I just feel like when it all comes together, I mean, again, we're confident as hell at four and six, but um, the players, I mean, what we've seen out of this offense, again, w- differently than years before, has just been awesome to see how they've been able to adapt. And I do think defenses will eventually change up. You'd think Jared, Gerard Mayo, after having uh, a glimpse of that earlier in the season, would have a different game plan, but um, I guess we'll see. 
Did he though? When you when you think it's Snoop, it was Snoop Huntley running the show there. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a little different. Um, I want to I want to talk about Alec Engel, Josh. But one quick question: Janu Smith, he had a fifty yard touchdown reception from Tua last week. It was the broken play. Uh, it was the dagger. Who's the next Dolphins receiver to have a fifty yard touchdown? Malik Washington. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I threw it. I, I tried to say OBJ. <laughs> I tried to go as crazy as I could. I was going to say Craig Crab, but I feel like Malik Washington's that guy that, you know, yeah, I'll go Malik Washington. You go OBJ. I like both those bets. I think that that's what we're finally seeing about this Dolphins offense. And Josh, it's so crazy that we're sitting here like, yeah, we're positive. We're sitting there at four and six, but it's because we're seeing these other playmakers make plays. OBJ is getting a few targets each re- week. And what we're seeing is that completion percentage going his way is going up and up. It, it seems like there were a couple of third downs um, where Tua doesn't even need to look. He'll know that Odell Beckham can beat his guy being that third or fourth cornerback, which has just been so damn impressive to watch. And, and that growth has just been always a, a great aspect of this Dolphins offense in the last month. Um, I wanted to ask you, Josh, Tua has been sacked five times in the last two games. Are sacks becoming an issue for this Miami Dolphins offense? Yeah, when I first saw you write that down, I was like, I do think it is. And then it, I started to realize, you know, how many of those are coming because, you know, two is starting to hold on to the ball a little more. They're starting to extend plays and, you know, get those, you know, impact plays that we're starting to see over these last few weeks. So it is a problem, but I think I'm okay with, you know, if we're taking sacks because you see Tua trying to spin out and extend a play or because of, you know, uh, this, that, or the other thing. But at some point they're going to pile up. And I think that might be an issue with the offensive line later down the road that we don't even want to speak about at this point. But yeah, man, I think you have to do a better job protecting Tua. But I think a lot of that's, you know, him just, you know, going through his progressions and trying to extend plays, which I love to see. And it's not, they haven't been disasterful sacks, right? It's not like uh Tua, you have 1.8 seconds to get rid of the ball. Full stop. You got to get rid of the ball. And that's, Josh, I think how we got into some situations where he would huck a ball into a linebacker's chest. There have been some scenarios where he's put the ball on the ground in t- forms of fumbles. But yeah, man, I think these sacks aren't an issue knock on wood yet at all whatsoever. I think the Miami Dolphins offensive line has been playing really well. And a big part of that has been stability. And Butch Berry was asked about Isaiah Wynn earlier this week. And this was something interesting to see. Just, just Twitter went full Twitter on this. Butch Berry said that when Isaiah Wynn's ready to go, and it seems like there's some jobs to music, it's like a, a three out of 10. It's not very loud, but you see, you, if you listen closely, Isaiah Wynn's coming back sooner rather than later. When he does come back, though, Butch Berry said that this could just be his coach speak, but he said that Robert Jones will be the starting guard, the starting left guard, even when Isaiah uh, Wynn is ready to go. Josh, what are your thoughts when you hear something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I immediately told you, man, yo, we should talk about this, right? I have the quote right here. Absolutely, Rob's done an excellent job for us. He's a great leader in the room. He's great on the field in terms of standard and how we want to work. And I think that kind of was a surprise to me because, you know, a few weeks ago, he was the the scapegoat, right? He was that, you know, spot where we could probably replace where if an Isaiah win was eventually a comeback, which I think at the time we probably thought was just uh, McDaniel, you know, just saying things like that. We thought he'd be implemented right into the lineup. So I, I like that Robert Jones has at least improved. I like that the locker room believes in him. And I love that, you know, it's continuity that this team is, you know, going with, right? It doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what the PFF grades say. If, if Butch Barry, to a ton below that offensive line, works better with Robert Jones out there for now. I'm all for it. I also think a lot of that has to do with Isaiah Wynn, right? You're not going to rush him right back out there, throw him into the fire. And you mentioned on a previous pod, he has versatility to play right tackle. I mean, Teron Armstead's banged up. There could be, you know, an issue there later down the road where maybe you need to move some players around. So Isaiah Wynn's a good break in case of emergency, but um, I'm intrigued to see if Robert Jones plays even better now that, you know, maybe he has a guy looking over his shoulder ready to take that job. It's just frustrating, and I don't know how to say this on Twitter without coming off like a jerk. Dude, we just played the Rams two weeks ago, and we were hyping up this offensive line because they were getting two Pro Bowl caliber offensive linemen back in the mix. One of them gave up a sack. The other one was hucking the ball over Matthew Stafford's head. Like, like continuity is so damn important for this group. And it's instantly, everyone wants to go, yes, let's treat it like Madden. This guy's a 73 overall. This guy's a 76. Let's put in the 76. I think this Dolphins offensive line, man, de- deserves so much credit. Just like think about how bad they were early in the season. Think about all the pre-snap penalties. Think about all the illegal motions, right? Think about the illegal men downfield. We've seen them grow and develop together. So for people to be like outraged 
pure outrage that Isaiah Wynn, who it's been over a year since he played football and he was someone who wasn't like a, a top tier player in free agency. And I'm not trying to, Hey, I'm glad we have Isaiah Wynn. I think he would be a great swing tackle. If, if everyone's still playing well, he'd be a great swing tackle, especially if Alec Ingold's still recovering from his injury, but it just kills me. We saw this happen two weeks ago where you have these good offense, quote unquote, good offense linemen come back and you realize it's a lot more than just a number, a, a talent level next to a name. Like that's, just frustrating, I guess. Yeah, and I'm the first one that has to have egg on my face because I think a lot of us, you know, came into this year thinking, okay, the offensive line, they still didn't do anything. This is going to be the year things kind of, you know, fall apart. Even the Aaron Brewer, right? I was a little bit skeptical in that. Mm-hmm. We all kind of wanted Connor Williams to come back. Connor Williams retired, and you hear Tua Tungavalo absolutely gushing about Aaron Brewer. Um, I have a quote here. I would love to have Brewer here for a long time. I love how he goes about his business. I love how we have a good relationship, how we communicate with things that we see and whatnot. But to me, it just feels like offensively with the offensive line, it just feels like we've all been playing together for such a long time. Doesn't feel like there's been a drop off anywhere. And I think that kind of goes back to what we said. I mean, this offensive line is playing awesome. Um, Yes, earlier in the season or last year, right? Schematically, they were getting the ball out quicker. We're not seeing that so much this year. There's obviously areas where they can improve on, but um, Butch Barry, Frank Smith, Mike McDaniel, whoever's truly in charge of that, or if it's a whole, you know, brain trust, they they all deserve their flowers for what we've seen. But man, we're on a roller coaster ride, right? We say that now, but and we say these sacks don't matter against what like the Raiders and teams like that. But we could have egg on our face next week and be, you know, Robert Jones off with your head and things like that. That's so true. You're you're 100 right. Um, Teron Armstead, he didn't practice this week. Uh, just the injuries are kind of piling up. He's uh, he's a playing a very physical position, but it does sound like uh, he's going to play. Josh, it kind of feels like this is something we're going to deal with the rest of the season, just kind of crossing our fingers each week that Toronto Armstead will be available. Uh, But something to keep in mind, man, even last year when he was going through all these injuries, he was out there for the playoff game. He was out there near the end of the season. So uh, are are you feeling confident that despite these injuries pulling or piling up for Toronto Armstead, that not only this week, but Thursday night against the Packers quickly after that, he should still be uh, healthy enough to go. Yeah, I mean, and we've seen it, right? I mean, it's kind of crazy. This dude's just like an ultimate warrior. I mean, we see him out there. He's like an all-pro. He does everything right when he's on the field. And we remember last year, I could have, re- I should have got season-ending surgery in week one. You know, he's out here to a time below saying he wish he could take some of his pain away because he's dealing with all these different injuries. So, um, Toronto Arms says an absolute warrior. I think he's going to go until the the – wheels fall off you know for lack of a better word but um when he's in that lineup you can tell he's a leader so i have no um doubt that he's going to be out there this week and then hopefully hopefully for that big game on thanksgiving day when we're all just hoping for the miami dolphins to get back to 500 somehow trying to survive after a day of uh turkey and drinks bloated and it's eight o'clock it's like yeah man let's, let's watch the dolphins go dolphins <laughs> i'll be looking like a bunch of turkeys uh josh have we reached the point? I can't believe I'm going to say this. Have we reached the point where Liam Eichenberg's career arc has become the get cut a villain or survive long enough to become a hero? Is, is that where we've reached? Because I've seen like the Dolphins Instagram <laughs> post about him five times. Mike McDaniel's yelling at his brother saying uh, his mom likes Liam more. Like, why did we not, how did we not see the Liam Eichenberg content coming? <laughs> Yep, another egg on my face. I, I I don't I don't know, man. I mean, it's all of us. He looked like Mister Incredible. Like we should be doing photo. I should probably be doing. We should be doing photoshops. They should be tweeting out like pictures of him as Mister Incredible. But, um, yeah. How didn't we see that? And then to hear the stories about him getting underneath the uh, opposing defensive lineman skin. Uh, he's an unsung hero. He's playing very well. And um, again, that's a lot more than I would have expected coming into the year. I mean, I was all about damn you, Liam Eikenberg, and he's proven us all wrong, at least for for now. And it's so corny, man. And the first few times you say it, it's fun to say, but the best ability is availability. And last year, the Dolphins had so many different offensive line combinations. I don't think they went more than two weeks with having the same offensive line combination. But Liam Eichenberg, man, he was always there. He's going to step in at center. He's going to step in at right guard. And and you can't discredit that. You cannot discredit just his his ability to just be available for this team. Overall, man, I I like where this offensive line is. I think it's going to get a little queasy with these colder games. You have Armstead and then Kendall Lamb on the other side. Ken, two guys who, you know, were the the big R word retirement is being talked about with them quite a bit. But for this Sunday, Josh, the Dolphins are facing a New England pass rush that had no sacks last week after sacking Caleb Williams nine times two weeks ago. Keon White and Dietrich Wise Jr. both have five sacks. The New England Patriots have 25 in total. What do you think about that matchup? 
Yeah, I mean, I like this matchup. I think, you know, just based on you saying that, I'm expecting, you know, a couple sacks here and there. But again, if the Dolphins can contain them and go about their way and still end up having success, it shouldn't be the the be all end all. I like the way this Dolphins offensive line's matching up. So I, I like I like it on paper, but that's going to be the final st- nail in the coffin, right? <laughs> I highlighted this seven times over because this is, to me, was so interesting. How do you go from having nine sacks, you're averaging more than two sacks a quarter, to having zero sacks an entire game? That, I think, is speaks to scheme. And when you look at Sean McVay was able to contain that Patriots defense. Matthew Stafford threw for four passing touchdowns against the Patriots last week. I think the Dolphins offense, famous last words here too, should be able to contain this New England Patriots pass rush. I think they're going to do things a little different. Obviously, everything's different when you're in a divisional game. But uh, going from nine to zero, man, the variance in that is so wide where I don't think it's as simple as, oh, let's just switch up a thing or two. That is a complete game plan. That is scheme. And the Rams showed a way to kind of negate that New England pass rush and just keep pushing the ball down the field. Yeah, and I hope the Dolphins can build off because I'm sitting here looking at the Patriots defense and they do got some names, right? Anthony Jennings, Yannick Nagoku, who all of us Dolphin fans wanted, Devon Godshall. I mean, so there's some names up there that can, you know, wreck a little bit of havoc. And mm-hmm. again, I thought Gerard Mayo was at least this guy that could scheme up some stuff. So um, it, it's a matchup I like on paper, but I'm, I'm not overly confident. Another matchup I'm not super confident in, Josh, but we're going to have to prove it. This new, this Miami Dolphins defense continues to outkick expectations, I think. They fell apart a little bit against the Raiders in the second half, uh, giving up some touchdowns, a lot of missed tackles. But do you see Anthony Weaver and company forcing Drake May into some mistakes on Sunday? I do, and I want to make sure I looked it up because, you know, we talked about how we could uh... – cause pressure for Will Levis to make mistakes and things like that. Drake may have six interceptions. He's think throwing one over the last few weeks. So um, they can absolutely wreak havoc. I think we've seen over the last few weeks, Chop Robinson's getting the pressures. I have a video that I created that eventually will come out probably mm-hmm. today. Uh, Chop Robinson's getting some pressure. We see him running those stunts and things like that. So I, I do like the way they match up. But again, I think the way that uh, New England's going to cause – uh, cause fits for Miami is when we do, you know, get to the quarterback and Drake may shifts away, right. Breaks the tackle because we see it with some players that, you know, maybe are lesser talents. So that's what scares me a little bit, but I, I do like what we've seen out of the Dolphins pass rush the last few weeks. Although we just really wish we get Bradley Chubb back, right? Like I, I feel like it's never going to happen. Bradley Chubb, Cameron, good. Neither were going to be activated off injured reserve this week for the Dolphins. My only gripe with this Dolphins pass rush, man, I want it to stop being like a, uh, like a, a data darling. And I want to see it just become like a media darling. I want it to turn from like PFF pressure rate to um, interviewing Chop Robinson after the, on the field after a three sack performance. You know what I mean? It, it's just getting that substance. I, I see it. I see the vision. I know Chop Robinson's going to be a good player, but man, I see this as an opportunity. Like you're facing one of the bigger quarterbacks. You are also a rookie and you think back, man, the Dolphins signed Bradley Chubb. They signed Jalen Phillips. Two absolute mammoth defensive ends in order to bring down Josh Allen. I am not calling Drake May Josh Allen whatsoever. But if Chop Robinson really wants to make that huge statement, I think this is a great opportunity. Especially, man, this is a a deep an offense that struggles, 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 struggles to push the ball farther downfield. So you look at Drake May, who's five of eighteen on downfield throws. Keep him in the pocket for half a second. That's all it's going to take for Chop Robinson to get there. And we do have to mention Kendall Fuller's out, right? So that's going to, you know, kind of neg- negate some of that, right? We have Storm Duck most likely out there. Maybe it's going to be Cam Smith. But, um, you know, maybe that gives Drake May a little bit – or those receivers a little bit more separation where Drake May can get the ball out quicker. I mean, I, I don't know. But I think the way that um, – again, this is setting up. You just got to contain Drake May, force him to make those mistakes, keep things underneath. I mean, you're looking at the receivers. You got Kendrick Bourne, who's solid. Keyshawn Bout, who I know that I've probably had a Devi share in at one point where I thought he might be worth something – he was not Jalen Polk. I think he might've scored on us. So they have some younger players, but again, uh, when you look at the matchup on paper, the way the Dolphins defense has been playing, I think they should go out there and shut them down. And that's why I'm a little bit hesitant to, you know, crown it this early. I wish Kendall Fuller was out here. Cause I think he would have been a great matchup against uh, 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 Bourne. Bourne was five for five last week. I think like 74 yards and a touchdown pop Douglas, another name he fumbled uh, in a recent matchup against the Dolphins. So we haven't really seen his explosiveness. You mentioned Polk. I think he was the one who had like half a foot out of bounds on that. Uh, what could have been game winning touchdown. It's incredible, man. How I how called it a touchdown. I just called it a touchdown. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> what the hell? 
pain, dude. Absolute pain. I, I would have liked that Fuller matchup, but um, who would you like to see step up in the boundary? We've had uh, Kohu do a little bit. We've had uh, Cam Smith over there. We've had Storm Duck in there. And before you answer, Josh, I'm going to just throw out a couple numbers here. Uh, nobody's been targeted more on the Dolphins' defense more than Jordan Brooks. 48 targets. He's allowed 38 receptions. Jalen Ramsey's second with 37 targets. Uh, Cater Kohu's third with 36 targets. Fuller is tied for fourth at 23. And then you go down the list. Cam Smith is ninth with 15 targets. Storm Duck has been targeted 11 times, allowing eight receptions. When you, I know I just kind of a lot of uh, number salad at you there, Josh, but did one name kind of stick out like a beacon there? Like, let, let's give him a shot. I mean, for me, I, I'd really like to see Cam Smith, you know, out muscle, I guess, right? Out muscle or beat out Storm Duck. But at the same time, I'm hoping Storm Duck can build on what he did last week and, you know, fight off Cam Smith. So I guess I'm torn between which one of those guys should step up. I guess I kind of lean Cam Smith because you used the draft capital to draft him, right? I mean, I know Storm Duck was an undrafted guy. He gave him a guaranteed bonus or some signing thing like that. But you want Cam Smith to step up, drop his nuts, things like that. So I'd hope it be him. But as of what we saw last week, it, it's Storm Duck's, uh, you know, got the inside track. Although Anthony Weaver said every week it could change. So is there one of those guys that stand out to you, Jake? No Ethan Bonner on the list? <clears throat> no Ethan Bonner on the list. I don't even think he's been – I don't even see him on the, on the target chart here for, for PFF. I, he could be I on another team's practice squad at this point. We, I don't even think anybody would know. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Kind of. Just kind of. Just kind of. I think, Josh, I'm trying to get the, the numbers here. I think I'm leaning Storm Duck. Uh, let's go through some missed tackles. Uh, Cater Kohu, in terms of coverage grades, he's missed seven tackles, which leads the league. That's a 27% missed tackle right here. That is absolutely bananas here. Uh, that's why I think Storm Duck. I think I want Cater Kohu playing in the slot, which is weird. You want your consistent tacklers in the slot. Uh, but but I think that let's keep that Storm Duck uh, momentum rolling. I, I think that will work. Josh, were you surprised? Um, I don't want to say people were calling for his head, but I saw four or five stories written in different newspapers, different coaches asked. Everyone's wondering, hey, are, is Jordan Poyer going to be bun benched? I know he hasn't been the most uh, impactful safety. He hasn't been the most consistent, but, but was that a surprise for you? A little bit. I mean, I'm I'm throwing out Trojan horse jokes and things like that. And I'm kind of been down on him, but I don't know that I would have gone Super that far. Down. I'm yeah, down too, yeah. but I don't know about Ben. Like, yeah, and I, I mean, you don't really have a better option, right? We'd love right. to say Patrick and Morris could come out here, but again, the Dolphins didn't have his bio ready for us on draft night. So, <laughs> I, and Marcus May, he was getting you know taken to the shadow cool. realm in the open field. So, I don't know what we want to do here. I think uh, Coach said Javon Holland might be. You know, he plays his best ball, or he will tell you that he plays his best next to Jordan Poyer. So, again, we're, you know, armchair quarterbacks, coaches, things like that. But it's the players. If they're saying that he's Jordan Poyer is that leader that we thought he was when he signed out in the field, you know, he can get those players in position. Isn't that liability that maybe we see that one big play and say, oh, screw you, Jordan Poyer. I'm okay, you know, trusting in that. But it was a little bit of a surprise to see some of these beat writers ask that question. I mean, there were probably players throughout these last few years where you could have asked questions like that, where they might have, they, they just didn't, you know, avoided it. But to throw Jordan Poyer under the bus like that, I don't, I don't know. I'm pretty down on him, but I don't know that I would have done that. Trey McBride, monster game against the Dolphins. Brock Bowers. I, I wish I had a word that's more scary than monster that we could use for what he did last week against the Dolphins. How is Miami going to contain Hunter Henry, Josh? I went in this Pepe Silvia rant that um, not that they're letting Brock Bowers really be the guy, but the Miami Dolphins aren't going to show their major adjustments against the Raiders, right? When you can go and win this game, you don't want to show the film of how we can take away a tight end. When you consider that Hunter Henry is New England's leading receiver, 46 receptions on 66 targets, 491 yards, and a touchdown. And you consider you have a short week coming against the Packers, who has this wide array of talented wide receivers. Wouldn't this be a good week to show some tight end stopping adjustments when you do know this uh, matchup is one that if you take away Henry May can kind of be running around with his head cut off a little bit? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think last week it almost seemed like you were mentioned. Dolphins were playing like zone in the middle, and they were just kind of letting Brock Bowers get the ball and then, you know, uh, swarming and attacking. I mean, you mentioned Hunter Henry's leading their team in, in everything, and you, when you're Drake May, your young quarterback, I mean, your security blanket is going to be the tight end. It's going to be Hunter Henry. So, yeah, use – 
I mean, I think Jalen Ramsey's probably a real like eraser, but I'd like to see Jordan Poyer, you know, Jordan Poyer, Javon Holland, anybody just can prove that you can stop a tight end. I mean, Hunter Henry was a very good tight end, still is a very good tight end, but um, there are matchups there that you should be able to win. So, yeah, man, find a way to take away the tight end and, and make a Jalen Polk, make a Kayshawn Bout, a uh, – missing the other guy's name. Who, who else was a receiver on Pop the – uh, Pop Douglas, there it was. I had Demario Douglas. His actual Pop, – Pop Douglas sounds much cooler. Kendrick Bourne was the other one. So they do have some playmakers, but, man, you, t- you should be able to win on the outside and force a guy like Hunter Henry to beat you and that way. That way you just take him away. Are you worried at all about that run game, Jake? Because that's the obvious the next step here is, uh, you know, R- R- Ramondre Stevenson running with his hair on fire, just bulldozing through our defense. I mean, that's that's a little bit scary to think about with how many broken tackles or missed tackles we've seen over the weeks. Yeah, and if you haven't listened to our most recent show with Dustin where we went into some of the trends for the Dolphins, he did a great job talking about Miami's missed tackle struggles and how a lot of them, shockingly enough, were uh, – Defensive lineman, Zach Steeler's missed tackle rate, according to PFF, is actually pretty high. The same with Clayus Campbell. Um, Stevenson on the year, 154 carries for 585 yards. That's 3.8 per carry, six touchdowns. But what I think works well for the Dolphins is that both Stevenson and Antonio Gibson, their top two running backs, have a total of two two carries that have gone for over 20 yards. This, these aren't guys who are going to absolutely torch your defense. These are guys where if you make a mistake, if you miss a tackle, I think it's going to be, it's not going to be as punishing to rally. And on top of that, I think something that I hope, hope the Dolphins can take advantage of is this running back room has faced a little bit of an identity crisis because Ramondre Stevenson has four fumbles on the year. He's looking like Tua with the way he's carrying that football um, out there. And that way we've kind of seen Gibson take over a bigger role at times. But Stevenson, he's back in the mix being that lead horse where um, Javon Holland, you want to have your big game. You want to start talking about that payday outside of like a PFF story a, a month ago or so. This could be the Javon Holland go force two force fumbles in this game. Limit Hunter Henry, Hunter Henry to three receptions for 40 yards. Go have a day, Javon. And it's starting to snow outside, too. I mean, it's just the perfect recipe for that. Yeah, I like that. The one stat that did jump out at me that scared me a little bit, and again, it's Ramondre Stevenson's play style, but 44 missed tackles this season. So, uh, again, the way the Dolphins, you know, struggle to wrap up, I'm a little bit fearful of that. But, uh, again, I like this matchup. I like the way the middle linebacker, especially the linebackers, right? Anthony Walker, the way he's been playing, the way Jordan Brooks, despite – I mean, you had that stat about him in coverage, but we've never really had good linebackers in coverage. And in the run game, they're absolutely awesome. So, Let's see more Deshaun Hand and find a way to stop that run game because I think if they can rely on that run game, that then changes everything, right? They so they start getting you know three four yards per carry. They can open up that play action and then Do some you got cute. Drake May, got Drake May rolling out and then we're getting a little bit scared here. So again, I feel like on paper the Dolphins should be able to just you know lay the wood, but that's what it's a little bit fearful because we've seen these division r- rivals, these matchups. How many years ago, Jake, when the Dolphins were absolute buns and you know the Patriots were winning Super Bowls, they'd still find a way to win no matter what. In these divisional games, I think you really need two, three players to take over, right? That's why I glow about Waddle, right? Waddle's always been a guy against the Pats. Somebody on defense, I mean, I I shoot the shot at Trevon Howland, Josh. Is there somebody you're going to be keeping your eye on where, uh, you know, if you were to see like just a couple TikToks even or just a couple clips and like this player made a tackle or missed a tackle, it would change the entire game. Does a name or a number stick out for that? Yeah, we'll go. We'll go with Cater Kohu. I'm going to go with him. He's going to bounce back this week. But again, we saw that missed tackle last week. It was all anybody talked about. I think he'll make some plays and and be that you know that nickel that we were proud of. You know, lightsaber man, that type of stuff. All righty, Mister Houts. The New England Patriots have scored less than 23 points in 10 of 11 games. Two part question for you: Does that trend continue? And what's the final score? Um, I'm going. I think the trend continues. Yeah, I think the trend continues. Can I go 34? I went 30. I said 34 something last week. I almost went with the exact same prediction as last week. Let's go 31 10. How's that sound? 31 10? I like that. I like that. 21 point win. 31 10. That seems four touchdowns and a field goal. No, I, I think when you see what Stafford th- did last week and that Pat's defense really did look helpless, I, I'm so interested to see what that means when you're facing that Shanahan scheme. And, and don't get me wrong, the way the Rams do it and the way the Dolphins do it are very, very different, but the tendencies are, are very similar. I think they get 27 for the fourth and five games. 30, 
Let's go 31-17. I think the Pats get a backdoor touchdown, maybe 10 points in the first half, and then maybe a third quarter where the Dolphins can really clamp things down. Man, I, I'm not trying to stall here, but I thought there was one more thing I wanted to ask you about. I don't think it was Alec Ingold. I thought it was something defense-related, but uh, if it's fallen out of my ear, it can't be too important. As long as it's not your brain, right? My brain sometimes slips out of my, my ear. I was get, what about the run game? I mean, do you think we continue? I guess it's going to be Devon Achan, right? Devon Achan with a little bit of Jalen Wright sprinkled in. Do we see more Mostert? I mean, he sounds like his hip's okay. He sounds like he's hungry and ready. That's one thing I – like the, the Raheem Mostert thing, man, there are so many layers to it, from the fumbles uh, to wanting to get Jalen Wright more involved to the hip injury that I completely glossed over as well. So so that's been so interesting. I think Mostert came out and said he believes we're all on the same page now, so that kind of implies that Mostert will be more involved. And, and I do think the Dolphins ran into a little trap, man. I think Wright was getting the ball on, like, Last week was a little better where I think he had five carries on 18 snaps, but the week before it was like eight carries and, and or excuse me, eight snaps and five carries where it kind of got a little obvious at times. And I think the Dolphins could get away with that, um, especially if Alec Ingold's back in the mix. I think McDaniel said he's the most optimistic he's been in the last three weeks, but it was a little discouraging to hear that this was something that was being managed and then it got worse. Yeah, and that's just the story of our life, right? I mean, it just seems like there's always something that tries to – it's always injuries with this team, and – I just hope we can stay healthy and, and get this snowball rolling, no pun intended. And we beat New England, man. Thanksgiving Day, Turkey Day is going to be a hell of a day. Win against New England, you have a shot at being 500 on Thanksgiving Day. You win against New England, you are back to 500 at Hard Rock Stadium, which is absolutely crazy to me. But thank you all so much for joining us today on another Dolphins podcast. If you like what you're listening to, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And you want to get involved with that conversation, you can send us an email at anotherdolphinspodcast at gmail.com. You don't want to do any of that work? Go over to YouTube. 560 WQAM. You can find all our podcasts there. Uh, I love reading the comments there. Some are sassy. A lot of people give us some love, and I, and I like seeing that. I, I greatly appreciate everyone who is joining us. With that in mind, go have a great weekend. Thank you all so much for listening to another Dolphins podcast. You're not like Josh and I dealing with the snow. Go enjoy the beautiful uh, southern sun, and most importantly, fins up. Fins up. Fins up.